What's up boys and girls, check the timestamps below to navigate through the chapters faster, read the description to the video, and let's do it. First off, how to get unique spellbooks, which you cannot buy from the vendors. Well, you need to open the crafting menu, then add any elemental skillbook, like Pyro, Hydro, Aero or Geo, then add any non-elemental skillbook, like Warfare, Huntsman, Scoundrel, Necromancy, Polymorph, or Summoning. Combine these two books to obtain a new hybrid skill. For example, if you merge any Scoundrel book with any Pyrokinetic book, you get the Sabotage, a skill which allows you to blow up enemies' grenades and arrows right in their inventory, if they have them of course. Or let's combine Scoundrel with Geomancy to get Venom Coating a buff, which adds additional poison damage to your weapon skills and attacks. There is also a higher tier of these hybrid spells. To do so, we again combine any non-elemental book with the elemental one. But this time, make sure that one of these books is a source spell. You can identify it by this little diamond here and overall glowy icon of the book. Vendors will start selling source books as soon as you hit level 9. Now let's look at the previous example with Scoundrel plus Pyro, which gave us a sabotage spell. This time though, one of the books is a source skill, and as a result, we get mass sabotage. If we do the same thing to Scoundrel plus Geo, instead of Venom coating, we get Venomous Aura. So go and experiment, or just pause now to see the full list. Next, Rune Crafting. If you see this tiny hole in the item, then you can insert a rune inside of it. Simply right click, then press Manage Runes. They have different effects and sizes. You can make them bigger by combining two identical runes with a pouch of pixie dust. For example, we take two small thunder runes, then we add pixie dust on top of it, and as a result we will get one medium thunder rune. By the way, you can easily unplug runes from the items, you just right click on the piece of gear, then press manage runes, then click on the rune itself. A couple of notes about pixie dust. Do not throw away or sell any bones and skulls. That is because you use them to create pixie dust mentioned earlier. This is the process. You combine mortar and pestle with skulls to get bone dust. Then you combine mortar and pestle with stardust herb, another key ingredient in rune crafting, to get stardust. And finally, you combine bone dust with stardust to obtain pixie dust. In the early game, the most useful runes in my opinion are Fire ones, which you put in the jewelry for extra crit, Masterwork ones, you put in the weapons for extra damage or physical builds, and Venom ones in the jewelry for extra accuracy. Last one is good, because by default almost any character has a 95% chance to land a hit with basic attacks or weapon-based skills like Warfare, Huntsman or Scoundrel, if you don't use any accuracy buffs of course. And if you played XCOM, you know how often that 95% chance to hit will fail half of the time. Later in the game, once you reach level 14, you'll get access to rune frames. These goodies you can combine with runes to further increase their power. The full list of effects is quite big and you may easily find it online, but you should note that you can't remove the frame once it's been attached to a rune, and thus some people prefer to save their frames until they buy or craft the biggest runes possible which can be obtained only once you reach level 16, since that is when you start acquiring high quality pixie dust, a key component in crafting giant runes. But you do you. Next, scrolls. Talking about every scroll recipe is pointless because there is a full list of all craftable items online. Besides, the effectiveness of different scrolls is tied to your builds. But with that said, here are the scrolls which will definitely work most of the time. Teleportation, Nether Swap, Fortify, Armor of Frost, Haste, Peace of Mind, Living on the Edge, Spread Your Wings, and of course, if you want to get Giga Omega Power, Skin Graft. I also need to point out that there are some spells that cost less AP in their scroll form than in their original memory form. For example, Ice Fan you learn from the books costs 3 action points, but its scroll version costs only 2 AP, which is weird but very useful. Here's the list of similar spells, pause it for the clarification. Also, there's a pretty cool recipe you might pay attention to. Combine any void tainted fish, high quality or alien tormented soul, and a sheet of paper to create a cursed scroll. It has a lot of interesting interactions with surfaces and statuses. For example, if enemies are stripped from their physical armor and they stand on blood, you may use the scroll on the surface to cause mass decay on those characters, after which you may damage them with healing spells. Or you can cast that cursed scroll on ice, fire, oil, spider webs, or even clouds. So I would highly recommend experimenting with it, but keep in mind that this void tainted fish mentioned above can be acquired only in Act 2. 
Next, grenades. Similar to scrolls, they have a huge list of recipes, and their usage might vary based on your build. But sadly, unlike scrolls, most of the grenades tend to fall off in the mid-game, and you would most likely use them for their secondary effects. Grenades like Thunderbolt, Terror, Frost, and Tremor are pretty good candidates to reapply CC when your other skills are on a cooldown. Firestorm and Cluster Nades could be infused with Source Orbs to increase their damage. With that said, Cluster Ones have a pretty weird hitbox, so they either become a grenade with the highest damage, or they do almost nothing. They work the best against targets with the big hitboxes on the open terrain. You may also infuse a simple Oil Flask with a Source Orb to make a nade which sets AoE Fortify, which can be quite handy in some situations. But sadly, Source Orbs are very expensive, so infusing them with grenades can be a questionable choice. Smoke Grenades can be used to either block enemies line of sight and force them to reposition, or to cover your team with smoke and then bless it to set mass invisibility. Chemical Warfare ones are the most expensive nades in the game, but without a doubt the most useful grenades are Love and Mind Maggot ones. And although Charm isn't a reliable crowd control effect because of a weird AI behavior, unlike other CC effects, it's being set for 2 turns by Love nades and for 4 turns with a huge AoE boost by Mind Maggot ones, which is insane by the way. Just keep in mind that there is a very limited amount of mind mega jars in the game. You can't buy them, they can be only found, so I would use them only in very difficult fights. Next, arrows. These are recipes for basic arrow crafting. The ingredients you see are mostly sold or being found in Act 1. To create special arrows, you either dip plain arrowheads in stuff like ooze, oil and water barrels, or combine them with essences, which is a pretty bad idea, because it's better to use essences in other crafting recipes. Again, the crafting list of special arrows is pretty big, so you'd better look it up online. But I should mention a couple of things. Normally, elemental schools scale all related damage. For example, pyrokinetic increases any fire damage, so not only spells like fireball, but also fire grenades. But sadly, it doesn't work on special arrows, despite the tooltip saying otherwise. Here, the character on the left has 10 pyro, and the character on the right has 0. Everything else is the same. UI tells us that the left guy has bigger damage numbers. But, in reality, as you can see, they did almost the same damage. What definitely scales special arrows is, weirdly enough, Warfare, the thing which increases all physical damage. Here, the guy on the left has 0 Warfare, and the guy on the right has 10. Everything else is the same. Now look at their damage output. The guy on the right clearly has bigger numbers, so if you're planning on using special arrows, then level up Warfare. Second thing, even if you're not planning on using special arrows, you may still craft them so that you can become a bit richer. And thus, it's a good idea to keep three basic barrels like oil, ooze and water next to a waypoint in the city, so that you can craft much faster. Third thing, charm arrows are both strong and expensive. In Act 2, you'll find a few areas with beehives which can be used to refill your empty jars of honey. This honey jar is a key ingredient in charm arrow crafting. So, theoretically, you can print money by buying plain arrowheads and turning them into charming arrows. But it may take some time. By the way, you can use the same beehives to create charm nades very quickly. Just keep in mind that these beehives can be found only in Act 2. Next potions. A lot of new players are overlooking these goodies. They cost only 1 action points or AP to use, which is very cheap for the value they provide. You may also add them to your skill bar and drink them very quickly right before the fight to give yourself a huge advantage. The list of potions you can craft is quite long, so we will talk only about what are, in my opinion, the most important recipes. First, armor potions. The thing you need to understand is that physical and magical armor are the most important defensive stats in this game. Once you lose either of them, you become extremely vulnerable to a lot of different CC effects like knockdown, stun, freeze, etc. It doesn't matter how much HP you have if you keep skipping your turns again and again due to CC. And so you need to either restore your armor or eliminate your opponents before that happens. So combine an empty potion bottle with Amadivier for physical armor pots or with Whisperwood for magic magical armor. By the way, if you combine two identical armor pots with each other, you get one bigger potion. For example, two small ones are combined into one medium one, and two medium ones are combined into one large potion. Sadly, in the vanilla version of the game, you can't combine two large armor pots to create a huge one, so you can only buy them from vendors. 
Second, resistance potions. Majority of the tough opponents who like to obliterate your team with elemental magic can be countered by drinking resistance potions, specifically medium sized and higher. You can increase the size with the help of augmenters. For example, you combine a small fire rest potion with an augmenter to get a medium fire potion, or a medium one with a high quality augmenter to get a large potion and so on. By the way, this augmented recipe also works with healing, poison, and armor potions. Most of the time, it's better to just buy resistance potions from vendors rather than to craft them. But with that said, you should buy and then combine a trumpet of death mushroom with an empty potion bottle to get a resist all potion, which can also be augmented. It's a very useful tool for dealing with enemy mages and bosses. Essence Potions. Throughout the game, you'll find or buy elemental essences, which can be used in scroll crafting, but you may also use them to create pretty unique concoctions. For example, you merge any earth essence with an empty potion bottle and you get a stone skin potion. This goodie gives a lot of immunities and more than 180 physical armor, which is quite a lot in the early game. The downside is reduced move speed and the fact that it falls off in the mid game. Now, if we replace earth with an air essence, we get a jellyfish skin potion. Basically, the way it works is that any opponent without a magic armor who hits you in melee will be stunned. And as you can imagine, it can be quite useful in the early game, since a lot of characters won't have big armor values, but the downside however is that it doesn't work on ranged attacks or spells, and the AI in Divinity is pretty smart. So melee characters with no magic armor will either choose another target, which is bad, or they will just skip the turn, which is pretty good. Now let's replace an air essence with a fire one. We get a potion of strong will, which gives you a lot of immunities for 4 turns. Keep in mind that these immunities can cannot be overridden, unlike peace of mind skill, which protects you from only one instance of CC. This strong will potion can also cure blindness, curse and silence. And finally, let's use a water essence to get a nimble tumble potion, which gives us a 50% chance to dodge any weapon based attack or a skill like warfare, huntsman or scoundrel. Just try it and see its value. And finally, the blood rose elixir. In Act 1, you will stumble upon a cave on the Dragon's Beach. In it, after a short and fruitful encounter with Radica, you will get a bouquet of Blood Roses. Combine it with an empty potion bottle and get the Blood Rose Elixir, which gives plus 1 to all of your attributes until the character's death. Keep in mind that this unique potion can be crafted only once per game, so think twice before giving it to one of your characters. Oh, one quick and important note. All of the potions which were or weren't mentioned above will get their effects doubled if you have 5 star diner talent, which is pretty nuts. Next, enchantment. You combine any melee weapon like a dagger or a staff with any poison source to add extra damage and a chance to poison enemies with hits. If you have the torturer talent, this chance to poison on hit will become 100% despite the UI showing different numbers. Walking and then slipping on ice is a very nasty way to get CC'd because it ignores your physical armor. To counter that, you simply combine your boots with nails. This gives you immunity to slipping on ice. Another thing you can do with nails is to combine them with any hammer or a mace. This will grant you 4 lockpicks for each stack of nails. It's a pretty good recipe for the early game. Later in the game, you will stumble upon the eternal artifacts. They are very rare, but they can be combined with your equipment to get certain upgrades. As you can see, the effects depend on which piece of gear is used in crafting. For example, rings will get plus 1 scoundrel, belts will get strength and warfare, and so on. As you can imagine, it might be a good idea to use eternal artifacts later in the game, because they can't be bought and only found. So there is a limited amount of them, and it's better not to waste them on low level gear. Keep in mind that there are also miscellaneous eternal artifacts, which can't be used in crafting. They look exactly as the ones you can craft with, so be aware of that. Also, the thick ones are used with armor and the thin ones with weapons. By the way, if you apply the eternal artifact to your weapon, which was previously coated in poison, then this will change its extra damage from poison to air, but the chance to poison on hit will be saved. Another thing you can do with the eternal artifacts is to craft the armor of the eternals. Combine a source orb, metal scraps, an eternal artifact and the eternal plate. There is a limited amount of those special plates in the game and they can be found only in specific areas. Keep in mind that you won't be able to highlight them like other items when you press alt. For example, here's one plate in the black pit mines in act 2. We press alt and see everything but this plate, so pick it up anyways and use it later. 
The Eternal Armor you craft from this is quite good, as it gives you shock and stun immunity. Plus, its level will be equal to the level of your character. By the way, you might replace an Eternal Artifact with a face capacitor you find in Act 3. Next, quest-related recipes. The things we're gonna talk about here are extremely powerful, but I need to mention some quests and locations. So if you don't want to know about this, then just wiggle your mouse around and move to the next part of this video. Firstly, Glowing Idol of Rebirth. This goodie automatically resurrects a character if they die, which, as you can imagine, is very useful in combat. It saves a lot of AP for your teammates, because they won't need to use a resurrection scroll on you, which costs 3 AP. Plus, it serves as a safety net against some one-shot encounters. Just don't swim in lava or death fog, though. But that's not the end of it. You see, being in combat doesn't prevent you from crafting. You can create potions, scrolls, arrows, and nades in mid-combat. And yes, this also applies to the resurrection idol. What I mean is, once the idol has been activated once, you may combine a resurrection scroll with the dull idol to recharge it. So basically you can make yourself immortal as long as you have enough scrolls in your inventory. More than that, your other characters might recharge it for you, since all inventories are shared. In order to get this glowing idol of rebirth, you need to find Dorothea in the Under Tavern in Act 2. Convince her that you deserve her kiss and pick this line of dialogue. Then you follow her and make out with a spider to get the idol. Keep in mind that you will lose 2 constitution forever, but this attribute is the least important one for sure. If you don't mind killing neutral NPCs, then you might slay Dorothea and get the dull idol from her this way. Secondly, Herb Mixes. You'll approach this giant hookah machine in the Under Tavern in Act 2. You'll buy herb mixes from this dwarf girl, plug this good stuff into the hole, and then take a deep breath to get some giga buffs for 50 turns. As you can see, they are pretty strong, and the AP recovery mix is the most broken one for sure. You may double the duration of 3 herb mixes if you combine them with a certain void tainted fish. In order to get the recipes, you will help this dwarf scientist at the Driftwood docks by testing his fish. Each person can get one recipe, but you can trick him by using a shapeshifter mask. Or just read this and pause it for the clarification. Thirdly, tea. In Act 4, you will be able to attend Lady Kemp's tea party. Long story short, the tea you craft with her help is the most broken consumable in the game. Specifically, the green tea reduces the AP cost of all your skills by 2 points. More than that, consuming it doesn't cost any action points at all, which is frankly quite insane. Try it and you will see. There is also a white tea, which increases your max AP by 2, which is extremely good for glass cannon characters. And the black tea just increases your fire resistance. In order to make those consumables, you need to buy tea leaves from Mrs. Kim and combine them with her teapot. If you have the noble tag, you will be able to receive some tea for free. Next, give backs. At any moment in the game, you have an option to turn on official mods, so to speak. Keep in mind that some of them you can't turn off, and enabling any give backs will disable all achievements for the current playthrough. A quick note, there is a Norbytes script extender you can find online. This goodie brings back the achievements even if you play with mods and give backs. It also speeds up load times for modded runs. A lot of people use this script extender, so it's pretty legit. But if you're a new player and you don't want to bother with this stuff, then just wiggle your mouse around and go to the next section of this video. Back to the topic. One of the gift bags will give you additional recipes to play with. It's called Crafter's Kit. For the most part, it adds a truckload of new hybrid grenades, an ability to craft and buy traps, create barrels like cursed oil and blessed water ones, but to be honest, those things are very niche. There are a couple of good things about this gift bag though. For example, with it, you will be able to coat your weapons with fire. First, you need a cooking station, which is easily created with the help of a cooking pot and a campfire. Then you combine this cooking station with any oil source and your weapon. And voila, you gave it extra fire damage and a chance to set burning. Oh, and just like with poison, the torturer talent will make a chance to set burning equal to 100%, despite what UI is saying. So basically, this is what you can do. First, coat a weapon with poison, then coat it with fire. This extra damage will be converted from poison to fire, because you can have both but you will keep the chance to poison on top of the chance to set burning. Another good thing about this gift bag is that you can finally combine large physical or large magical armor potions into giant ones, which isn't possible in a base game. For now, you can combine a cooking station with plain arrowheads to turn them into fire ones, which can be later combined with oil to create an explosive arrow, a much more expensive version of a fire arrow. A full stack of those can be sold for a very decent sum of money. 
We can also craft high tier blank skill books, which might be quite handy for experienced players, as it gives you access to pretty powerful spells very early in the game. For example, you might buy an Epidemic of Fire scroll from Lohar in the Under Tavern as soon as you reach Act 2. You combine this scroll with a high tier blank fire book and get an Epidemic of Fire skill, which you would normally buy at level 13. Of course, you would have to know where to look for those high level scrolls in the first place and you need a sufficient amount of source points to actually use the skills. And also, those blank book recipes require distinctive ingredients. In order to get those, you gotta turn on Herb Garden's gift bag. And finally, some quality of life stuff. The easiest way you can get ingredients for your crafting is to buy them from vendors. And so, every time you encounter a new neutral NPC, press this button to trade with them. See if they are just basic NPCs or actual merchants. You'll soon notice that there are different types of vendors, so it's up to you to remember who sells what. It's important to note that if you don't see some ingredients you need, then it means one of the two things. Either you trade with the wrong vendor, or your level is simply not high enough. For example, if you want to craft, let's say, a nether swap scroll, you will need a high quality air essence, but they start appearing only at level 8, so high quality ingredients require you to have a higher level. Also keep in mind that all vendors restock their merchandise every hour or when you level up. It's worth mentioning that vendors will keep all the loot you sold to them, and so if you want to see only new stuff after a restock, then click here and pick latest added. Now all the new toys will be shown at the bottom of the list. And speaking of the inventory management, these buttons will help you to find your stuff much easier and faster. You may find certain recipes much quicker by using this search bar in the crafting menu. Oh, another cool thing is that you can drag an item into a crafting screen directly from the ground, or just right click on it and press combine with. As you progress through the game, you will notice that your inventory turns into a mess very quickly, so it may be a good idea to put similar items in different containers. If you don't want to bother with containers and bags, then press this icon sort by. But do not turn on improved organization gift bag or you will regret this. You may also send your items directly to your personal chest, but you gotta reach Act 2 first. Alright, that's it. Like, subscribe, recommend this video to your friends. I stream right here, check the description to the video, and have a good day.